Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here, uh, and I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Glad that you're uh, joining us, and whether you're online or you're here in person, I'm so grateful that you've given us your time this morning, and more importantly, that um, God has been at work uh, in you directly, or maybe in the person who invited you to come, uh, and you're wondering why you're here. Uh, but God is at work uh, in this place, and one thing he wants to do uh, is make us all aware of the truth of that song, uh, is that the only real help for all the things that really threaten us in life is Jesus. And that's the core. Uh, I don't care how bright you are, how much money you have, how much influence you have, how well regarded you are in the circles that you run, uh, what athletic skill you have, uh, whatever body uh, you are gifted with or not, uh, none of those things will ultimately provide for you only what Christ can give. Uh, because the deepest need that you have is to be righted with the God that you have been made for. Uh, your sin and your decisions to walk off on your own. As Grayson was talking about, we're all prone uh, to think that we can make it or at least that we can figure it out if we can look around and find the right influences and the right people and the right mechanisms that somehow we can figure out life and make it work. Um, and the core of life really is coming to the point where you recognize that you're absolutely defenseless on your own, you're absolutely hopeless on your own, you're bankrupt and empty, and where you humble yourself before the God and ask Him to do something for you you can't do for yourself. Uh, the wonder is that God stepped in uh, with broken rebels uh, and came after us, and He took the consequences of our sin into Himself so that if we just put our faith in him, we get the benefits of his death uh, that raises us to life and brings us to life. And so I want to encourage us all today. I just love that song. I, I think the older I've gotten, uh, and I have to come, I have to reckon with now uh, that I'm the old guy. Uh, I had to kind of figure that out and, and get that in. I've got all these young guys that I work with now. Uh, and, you know, I, I teach at college, and, and the irritating things about college students is that, you know, every year I get older, and every year they're the same age. It's just really annoying. Um, and so they're perennially young, and I'm getting older uh, as the time goes by. I, I want to invite you to turn to James uh, chapter 2 with me, if you will. Um, we're going to take up a topic today that is a very contemporary one and, and difficult uh, for us to think about. It's one that we're going to be prone to think that we're not uh, being spoken to by James in this passage uh, because it's, it's just kind of unsavory uh, to think about that you're the person that's going to be spoken about here. Um, and uh, I think James is going to come and, and kind of step on all of us uh, as we walk through this passage uh, because uh, uh, one of the core things that we often do is that we think uh, we know the best way to navigate life, and especially in terms of relationships, we think that we know the best way to do that. Uh, and God's advice sometimes seems so counterintuitive to us. Things like um, uh, loving people uh, who really have no social resources to benefit you. Uh, of throwing your life uh, at people that the culture will think that you're stupid for doing so. Um, one of, one, of the, one of the women that has impacted me over my life was uh, a little woman by the name of Frances. Uh, Frances and her sister Emily uh, were here at Emmanuel for years. And Frances was uh, just someone who was just full of joy. She's very petite and small. I don't know if she was four foot something, what Frances was. But Frances was a nurse. And Frances had, had dedicated her life uh, to caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, if you have uh, cared for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease, some people call it the long goodbye. Um, and you're there and you're with them. Physically, they may be very healthy. Physically, they may be uh, not sick at all. Uh, but all of a sudden, you disappear from their mind and their memory. And then often, uh, because of the effects of Alzheimer's, uh, you even are perceived in their paranoia as their enemy. And you get yelled at and treated poorly and uh, they don't recognize you. And if you're a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife, that, that's just extremely painful and difficult. Um, and she had dedicated her life really to in-home care of people uh, who had Alzheimer's. Uh, people that would often not recognize her 
not appreciate what she was going to do for them, uh, think that she was actually someone who maybe was hostile to her, but it was her delight to, to give her life for the sake of those kinds of people. Um, James is going to come to our propensity here, our prideful propensity, is that driven underneath all of us, we want to be elevated. We want to be made much of. We want to be well regarded. Uh, we want people to think that we matter and that we're important. We want to be a person that other people want to know. Right? We want people to hang on our words. We want people to uh, look at us and admire our physique or admire our achievements or admire the things that we've had. And that's just the way we are. We are, we are wired, to use the biblical term, for vain glory in our sinfulness. We want to be elevated and people to elevate us, and so we often structure our relationships to try to find the people that we think will elevate us the best. And uh, what James is going to step in and talk to his people and make them recognize how evil and dark and hateful that posture is. Yes, hateful, as we talk about it. Now, we're in the book of James, and we've been talking through the book of James and uh, one of the things we've been reminding ourselves of is that it's important for us, especially in the West, right? Often uh, uh, missionaries and people from the 1040 window or the two-thirds world uh, have this little phrase where they talk about first world problems. Um, and so we face some of those first world problems as we've had supply chain things that have happened and all of a sudden we only have, you know, uh, four varieties of our favorite thing instead of 10 varieties. Um, uh, or instead of all the toilet paper that we want to buy because you can never have enough toilet paper, uh, there may be a shortage, right, of those kinds of things. And the first world problems we think about are things like, uh, um, uh, which I had uh, recently, I had a pair of glasses that had started to uh, fall apart and they were just hanging on my face and constantly irritating me. Uh, and I just, I just immediately thought of James, count it all joy when you fall into various difficulties, right? Um, and here what we're talking about in the book of James is we're talking about people who are refugees. We're talking about people who are literally running for their lives because they're being persecuted for their belief in Christ, the Messiah, by the people formally that they used to go to synagogue with, by the people formally who were their family and friends, by aunts and uncles, by people who knew them, right? If you read your New Testaments, uh, and it talks about the growth of the early Christian movement. The first martyr in our New Testament, the first person who was killed for his profession of Christ as Messiah, was a Jew by the name of Stephen, who was killed by his fellow Jews in a very public, personal, dark way. He was stoned. And he was very likely stoned by the people in his synagogue, the people that knew him. It wasn't a group of strangers killing some unknown guy who had showed up in their town to talk about this crazy rabbi Jesus. Uh, this was a known man, and they wanted to, by virtue of stoning, stoning was, was calling the community to say this is a communal decision. We're all in on this. We all agree with it, and therefore we're going to take part in the execution of this man. And so the persecution that, that followed that was led by someone who later is going to be uh, turned 180 degrees by this Jesus, the Messiah, is Paul. And we meet him first as Saul, and he's the ringleader, actually, of the persecution to begin with. Uh, when he comes to Christ and believes in Jesus, uh, he comes as a man with literal blood on his hands. He had set there his first little appearance is when he's holding the cloaks to help people stone Stephen more effectively. Uh, he had gone from house to house and drawn people out and thrown them in prison. Uh, it, it is no wonder in the history of the church that God needed to appoint a special agent to introduce Paul to the church because nobody would believe him to walk into their church that he wasn't there for nefarious reasons. And so this beginning is the persecution very likely that broke out. You can read about it in Acts chapter 8. You can read about this persecution and it caused people to flee for their lives. They're in Jerusalem, Judea, and they're spreading out. They're losing their homes. They're losing their social network. They're losing their support network. Many of them are losing their immediate families. They're being hated by their moms and dads, hated by their aunts and uncles. They're being turned on by their grandparents. Children are betraying uh, parents and parents' children, right? Exactly what Jesus prepared his disciples for. And so here they are, and it's a very, very dark place. 
And we've been talking about, as James steps into this group of people, uh, he's trying to help them navigate a very, very dark moment. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to find is, is James seems at first read to just be very abrupt, very harsh, if you will. James comes in, gives direct advice about what they're to do. But as you read the letter, one of the things that you see over and over again is James says, brothers and sisters. And sometimes you go, my dearly loved brothers and sisters. Right? And this is, this is the pleading of a man who understands that these people are in desperate conditions and the choices they make have radically different consequences. Radically different consequences. And James's terminology is that if they respond rightly to these, these difficulties, they'll go down the path of life and know God's blessing and be able not only to know life themselves, but to bring life to other people. They go down the other path, they go down the path of sin and death. And they know destruction, brokenness, anger, uh, disillusionment, conflict, all those kind of things are waiting on the other side. And they're there in this moment. And so James steps in, as we've looked at, he begins in chapter one, and right away he acknowledges, right, the elephant in the room. He doesn't dance around and say everything's great and so forth. He just comes right at his very first, as he starts, count it all joy when you fall into various difficulties. Right, so we're going to talk about difficulties. And he's going to talk about the issue that, that you need to approach them with a deep confidence that God isn't absent, that God is good, that he's at work even in these moments that are unjust, even in these reversals, even in these moments where you're not being treated rightly, even in these moments of abuse, that God is not absent, that God is good. And the only way you're going to be able to get through this situation to know the goodness of God, to be able to grow and to grow deeper in your faith and to become a person who knows protection, deep security, the way you're going to get through here and navigate it in a way that's going to be a blessing for you and the people in your life is if you look to God because every good gift comes down from Him. And so he says, here's the trials and you're going to be, you're going to be tempted to doubt God's goodness. You're going to be tempted to doubt that God is present. Matter of fact, you may even think maybe God is doing evil. And so James says, no, no, God is not tempted by evil. He does not do evil and he does not motivate anyone to do evil. And God is going to step into the broken world that is the consequence of human sin. And he's going to so work to actually turn this dark moment that somebody meant for evil for you into something really good. He's going to work out in your life what Joseph knew in his own life. You remember the famous statement from Joseph. You can read it in the end of the book of Genesis in chapter 50. As he looks at his brothers who sold him into slavery. Right? Everybody needs brothers like that, right? Had sold him into slavery. His closest friends, his family members had betrayed him and given him over. Didn't care what happened to him as he went off with a slave trader to never see him again. And he's standing there in front of his brothers and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He's done something deep and profound in me and now he wants to do something deep and profound, ironically, that's even going to bless you evil people despite what you've done to me. So Joseph understands the goodness of God and he leaned into God. So Joseph, as you know, it was following God, obeying God and what happened, right? He was faithful to God. He didn't sleep with Potiphar's wife and what happened? What did he get the reward for that? Three years in prison. Faithful. He was, he was there unjustly. He was wrongly put there. She, was, he li she lied about him, all those kind of things like that. What did he do? He blessed the people and was faithful to God in his imprisonment. Then God brings him out, makes him one of the co-rulers in Egypt. Why? Because God was going to use him to redeem and relieve his own people. So the issue here is what we have with the book of James is now, as he's taught them about that, he said the only way you're going to get through that is if you look to God for wisdom, and then that means then that you're going to be people who listen to everything God says to do it. You're going to be people who listen to obey. And so you're going to hang on every word of God. And as Grayson was talking about, you're not going to look to your peers in junior high to tell you how to get out of this difficulty. You're not going to look out on Instagram and uh, the reels to try to figure out how to get through life. You're going to open the word of God and you're going to turn to the people of God and say, I need to hear the voice of God right now because this difficulty, I'm about ready to lose my mind. I'm about ready to freak out. I don't know if I can hold life together. How do I get through this? 
Well, James says you listen to do God's word. You hang on every word. You linger, you listen, and you obey. That's the only way you're going to get through. Well, when we come to this section, now he begins to start addressing the ways that they haven't listened to God, that they haven't paid attention, and they've responded sinfully to the pressure that they've had, right? All of us know the sting of, sin, of, of, of responding sinfully to pressure. All of us have had the moment when somebody comes to us and says something carelessly, or they're freaked out, and then we freak out on them in return, right? Or something happens, and you have a bad day, and then you go around and say, I have a bad day, so everybody in my life's going to have a bad day today, right? Or where something bad happens to you and then you go curl up in a fetal position somewhere in the room and sing, woe is me, right? I am undone, okay? Somebody needs to take care of me over here, right? And then you excuse your behavior. You can yell, you can rage, you can withdraw. Why? Because you were treated poorly. And so all of a sudden you begin to justify your behavior. It's what James says, put every kind of moral filth away and and the overflow that comes out of evil. Because once you respond, well, sin just builds on sin, right? You lie, you got to cover up the lie, right? If you blow up on people, then you've got to justify why you blowed up and blowed up, why you blew up, how about that one? Why you blew up and all those type of things. So you begin to justify it instead of confessing it, instead of coming back from it, sin just builds on sin. And all of a sudden you've broken a relationship and you put boundaries between yourself and another person because you won't own up to the fact that you were out of bounds, and you responded sinfully, right? You ran to find some place to get out. So as we've looked at it here, what he's dealing with is moments where instead of them holding fast to the truth of God, they've let go. They've let go and they've grasped after something else to help them. And so we've tried to illustrate it in this kind of way, right, where the believers are here and these kinds of things are happening, right? And James is not denying, James is not Pollyannish, right? He's not coming in and saying, hey, I know everything's great, Right? Isn't it great, everybody? Yes. Say it after me. Everything is great. No, that's not what he's saying. Or, or the way we treat sometimes each other within the Christian faith, and we go, how are you doing today? And you know what the answer should be, fine. Right? That's what the answer should be. If, you're, you know, if you love Jesus and you're following him, you should be fine today. So I go over to Tabitha, how are you doing today? And Tabitha's supposed to say, fine, because I don't want to know if Tabitha's not doing well, because I don't want responsibility for it, number one. Number two, it kind of might, I might get too enmeshed in her life and get involved in things, and that's a little uncomfortable, right? Uh, and maybe third, I just don't want to share with her the junk in my life either, so I don't want her probing me, so if I probe her, it might encourage her to probe me, and I don't want that to happen. I don't want Tabitha to ask me about things seriously in my life, right, because I got things I'm holding close to the chest, so I tell her, Tabitha, how you doing? She says, fine, and then she says, Greg, how you doing? I say, fine, and off we go, and we're not fine, but we want, right, we don't want to deal with the issues that are there. Well, they're abused. They're, they're disillusioned. They're deserted. They, they've got dreams that are crushed, right? Well, sometimes when we think of people, you know, 2,000 years ago, they're as human as we are today. They love their kids as much as you love your kids. They had dreams for their children as much as you have dreams for yours. They, they wanted a marriage that functioned and worked as much as you want a marriage that functions and works. They wanted their family to stay intact. They wanted their mom and dad to be there. They wanted to, be, they wanted to grow old and they wanted to have their children there to, to, to care for them in their old age. They wanted all the things that we want, right? And all of a sudden now, they don't have a place to live. They don't know if they can provide for their families. Uh, they're hated by some of the people that are closest to them in their life and they don't know how to navigate the fact that my uncle hates me, that my parents hate me, that these things happen. This is one of the things that they're rushed. And so what happens is these things crush in. Unfortunately, we're going to get to the situation where God drops out of the picture. And what happens is despair comes in. We know that despair is happening. We know that anger is happening, right? This is what Pastor Steve talked about last week. There's no surprise that James says when you come into these difficulties, don't be quick to speak. Keep your mouth shut, right? Don't be quick to anger. Be slow, slow. Don't don't let your things just pop off, right? Now, for some of you, um, that's a harder thing for you because you're just a pop-off sort of person, right? Whatever happens, you just respond to it immediately. Nobody has to wonder what's going on in your soul because it's all over your face and it comes right out of your mouth, right? 
For other people, it just kind of goes inside and you stew and it burns and it turns into anxiety and rage and, and bitterness, disappointment, right? So anger takes many different manifestations and so does despair too. Despair can be somebody in a fetal position on the side, but despair can also mean, well, what does it matter? What does it matter? I don't care. I'm going to do anything. What does it matter? I tried to serve God. I tried to go to church. I tried to do that. And then look what happened. So who cares? That's despair, right, in terms of operating that way. Anger happens and people withdraw, right? That we talked about this as like an abused child, like, God, I... I'm too afraid to run from you, but I certainly don't feel near to you. Like, where are you in this moment? And then what inevitably happens is they turn to false saviors. They figure out some way to get out of it. They have somebody to turn to, some way to go after it, some, some method, some principle, some person, some group, right? some institution, they're going to find something because you're not wired, and this is the, the truth about whether you want to know it or not, you haven't been created to bear that pressure indefinitely. You've not been created to do that. And if you don't find an appropriate way to release it, it will be released somewhere. And, it, and sadly, among many of our young people today, it's being, their despair is being released in suicide. It'll be released in drug abuse. It'll be released in alcohol. It'll be released in pornography. It'll be released in, in uh, immersion in meaningless activities and entertainment that keep you detached from reality. It'll be in all kinds of, you're not wired. And of course, many of those ways, all they do is they just numb you to it, distract you from it, but they don't ultimately deal with the issue. They don't deal with it. And some people even think, well, the false savior is, and you're reading about that right now, the way that I deal with, with the disappointment that I have in life is maybe I need to kick my husband to the curb and go get a new one. Maybe I need to experiment all the way around. Maybe I just need to mix things up, right? So the idea here is what James is dealing with is he's dealing with those kinds of moments, and what he wants to do now is step back in to these moments. And he illustrates for us something important about the Christian life, even as he's walking through this. There's something about a believer and something about the nature of love. Is not only, if you're a follower of Jesus, will you constantly work, walk to Jesus, listen to Jesus, pay attention to Jesus, right? So many different things in life. I don't know the exact thing to do. Sometimes when people in my life are going crazy, or things are happening in the culture at large, I don't know the exact thing to do to respond to that. The only thing I know that I need to do every day is I need to get on my knees, and I need to talk to Jesus, I need to open the Word of God and listen to Jesus, and I need to get around the people of God to help me to figure out how to follow Him. One of the things I don't want to do is let the crisis give me an excuse for kicking Jesus to the curb. Right? So I need, I need that. And so one of the things that's going to happen if you're a follower of Jesus is when you get to difficulties, you're going to, you're going to push into him because that's the only way you can get there. And if you're a follower of Jesus, one of the things that, that is uh, incumbent upon you, that is, is important for you, that will be an outworking of Christ's love in you, when you see somebody going off the beam, when you see somebody uh, breaking out in rage against somebody else, when you see someone acting in despair, when you see someone turning to pornography, when you see someone picking up the bottle, when you see someone just checking out and disappearing from the community, you'll go after them. You'll go after them. Love demands that you go after them. Right? If you're, if you're a, a, a mom or a dad in here, you do that every day with your kids. You don't love your kids every day because they treat you the way they should. Sometimes they don't even treat you nicely. Sometimes they take you completely for granted. But why? You go after them because you love them. And you go after that bad behavior because you love them too much to leave them to go down that path where they're going to be lonely and broken and people don't want to be around them and they bring in suffering and difficulty in their life. No, you step in there and you take their anger. Sometimes you take their rejection because you love them too much to let them go that way. Love does not manifest itself in letting other people get into sin because you just don't want, it's too uncomfortable for you. It's too awkward, right? 
Now, again, this is not a whole bunch of people walking around, you know, going after each other. This is James watching people walk off the cliff. He's not running to somebody else to ask them to go do something. James is stepping in to say something, right? And this means, of course, that you're so tethered to, you're so tied to the truth of God, you believe in him, you believe that he's good, that you'll even step into a relationship that the person may reject you, but you've got to tell the truth because that's the only way you can love them. You never get confused, right, which I hear sometimes at Cedarville. I have a student come to me and say, you know, I've got one of my buddies or one of my girlfriends, and, and she's heading off into a, a, a dark direction, you know, and I'm coming to you and seeing if there's anything that you can do right? Sometimes they're looking for advice, but always what I say to them, I said, you're their friend. You're the person that God has placed in their life. I'm going to give you some advice, but you're the one that needs to go back after that friend. And the person may respond to me and say, but I'm afraid I'm going to screw up our relationship. And I said, if you continue to behave the way you are and tolerate that sinful behavior and let your friend walk off the cliff, you're the worst kind of friend already. You suck as a friend. You're a terrible friend. If you love them, you're going to go and say, I beg you, I love you, please, please don't go this direction. Now, they may reject you. They may call you a holier than thou, whatever. They may say, okay, you don't have to know your business, okay? But in your knees, you're going to pray for them to turn back to Christ because love cannot rejoice in evil. Do you remember that? 1 Corinthians 13, love does not rejoice in evil. And love doesn't hide from evil. Love doesn't condone evil, right? And so, so this is, I don't know if you notice at the very end of the book of James, this is what he says about his book, okay? And I put it here in the Christian Standard Version because I think they actually render it a um, way that, that gets at the idea is that what, you're, what James is basically doing is he's stepping into people who are deliberately wandering away from the truth under the pressure of the circumstances. He says, my brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. Right? And this is James. We've, been, we've learned just from last week. Sin gives birth to death. Right? Evil desire multiplies, it, it gestates, right? It, it, it gives birth to sin, and sin multiplies and gives birth to death. And when you step into a person's life and you short-circuit that cycle, you deliver them from the consequences of their sin by God's grace, and you save a multitude of things. So that's what he's up to. All right, so here's his first principle. Let's read 2, 1 to 13 and walk through this quickly. My brothers and sisters... Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy and old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, he's guilty of breaking all the law, all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. In his summary, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So, his first principle that he wants to get after, right? And I've used this little uh, metaphor, right, to talk about here. 
um, and using the metaphor of a glass, glasses that you put on. This stuck in my mind since I got my new glasses, right? So I'm not trying to advertise that. I just stuck in my mind. But as I, as I got those glasses, uh, one of the things that uh, you'll go back and sometimes you get your prescription improved, those kind of things along those lines. But after you've worn uh, crappy glasses or, you know, you realize after I've gotten rid of my glasses just how actually scratched and worn the lenses were, Right? I said, you know, people are so much clearer. I don't know if that's a good thing with some people, but it, it, they are clearer, right? And you can see things differently. And I don't have stuff, I don't have, in my old glasses, I had a scratch that went down vertically on this left-hand side. I miss it. It was kind of my friend, right, for a long time. So it scratched over here. The glasses tilted outwards because they didn't hold right. And there were all kinds of things. And you recognize just how cruddy your, your vision was because the, the glasses themselves were so worn and scratched and everything else was gone, right? But what James is talking about here is that they're deliberately taking the spectacles of God's wisdom, his word, and they're taking them off and they're putting on other glasses. And it's the pressure of the difficulty that, if you will, it's like it's knocked those glasses off. And the pressure of the moment is that they don't think that those glasses, the wisdom that God's going to give, the vision that he wants to let them have about life and how to think about this problem, how to get through it, they don't think that they can trust that vision, so they're looking for another pair of glasses, right? They're looking for another one. They're looking for somebody else to bring things clear and to give them guidance to walk their way through. And so what's happened to them under the pressure of it, and again, it's real pressure. And we can, you know, if you step into the life of a believer who's going through a very dark time, you ought to step in with empathy and tears and understanding. Sometimes I don't, I don't know, when you walk into a room of someone who's got a terminal diagnosis, we were, my wife and I were talking about this with her mom, just, just wondering what went on in her mind when you finally come to grips with there's no going back from this illness. There's no medicines that are going to help. There's no surgery. There's nothing there. And you, if you've been around people like that, they deny it for a while. They, they have hope. They want to get something to fix it. They go after it. They try everything that they can. But when it finally settles in and uh, you know that there's no way out, one of the things that a, uh, that a person who's healthy will do is they will accept that truth. Other people will try to put the glasses of denial on. No, it's not happening. No, it's not happening. But if you step into a moment like that where you find somebody who's deep and dark, you ought to step in there with just, you know, soft foot treads. And you ought to be praying for them. You ought to be crying with them. You ought to understand, try to understand what it would be like to feel the fact that uh, death is an intruder at any point in life. Death is a fear invoker. Right? All those kind of things like that. And you step into that moment. You should not walk in a smile on your face and say, hey, things are great and things are going fine. But that's not what James is saying here at all. The pressures are understandable why they would do something stupid. If you've ever seen somebody under pressure do something stupid, right? Like, you know, the classic one where you've got something burning, right, on the stove and you know that this grease fire is not put out by, right, uh, water, but nonetheless, you're freaking out and putting water on it and watching it get worse, and somebody who's standing back there going, no, no, that's the wrong thing to do. Well, sometimes pressure can make you do really stupid things. Really stupid things. You can scream at people. You can strike your kids. You can grab somebody by the arm way too hard and jerk them around. Right? You can do all kinds of things in the face of pressure. And so we're not denying the reality of what James is saying. There's some truth and there's a God who's big enough to not let you get there. And matter of fact, the choice, and this is the key thing, the difference between a good response to a difficulty and a poor one isn't, doesn't lie in the provision of God. God's provision is rich and available. The difference between someone who goes down the path toward life and the person who goes down the path toward death is whether or not they're going to pause and invite God into the moment. That's the key thing. And sometimes when you're in the darkest moment for other people, you're the one who's inviting God in by virtue of your presence and your prayers to help them hold on to something when they're facing the teeth of the difficulty, the teeth of loneliness, right? The teeth of fear, all those kinds of things. You're the one that steps in. 
And so favoritism here, a godless self-centered view of relationships is contrary to a trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's happening here, if we look at the occasion of what's going on, he just simply, you know, he points to the fact that God's glasses are laying on the floor, right, if you will, right? And the, points out the fact, James comes in and says, okay, uh, many of you may recoil, right, and say, I'm not a favorite, I'm not a person who, who exercises favoritism. And James says, yes, you are, right? And so one of the things that happened, you're responding wrongly to the pressure, and it's showing up in the way you're treating rich people and poor people in your services. So if you look here, look at verses two through four, this is what he says. Uh, he says here, suppose a man comes into your meetings wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the, clo the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. You have, not, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, now what James is doing here is he just pointed out the fact that this is happening in the congregation, right? He puts it as a supposed kind of idea, suppose somebody comes in, but what we're going to find is, as we read later on in James chapter five, that they, he, he actually rebukes the rich and warns them because what they're doing, and this is what's happening, he even intimates it here a little bit later on, they're putting people who curse Jesus in positions of honor. They put people who curse Jesus in positions of honor. Later on in chapter 5, he's going to rebuke the rich because what's happening in this vulnerable setting is you've got these people who need, they need to survive. They need to survive. And so they're looking to people who provide jobs, people who could give them security, people whose reputations may even protect them and provide security for them. And so what they're doing is they're sucking up to these rich people. And they're using their social capital to do it. And what is their social capital? They got this little group of people who meet together. And in the ancient world, you're always looking to, to increase your honor and your standing. And so now you find a group that wants to treat you as a patron. They want to invite you in, hold you up, and honor you. Well, they're looking around and say, well, there's this rich man over here, and he's pretty powerful. And, man, he could offer us jobs and all these kind of things like that. So let's bring him into our congregation, our little gathering here together. And let's give him a, a seat of honor because he could provide us with a job. He could, and many of them are working for these people, but these people are people who don't confess Christ, have no concern for the well-being of the people. And later on, we find in James chapter 5 that they're, they're working for these people. And at the end of the day, the people are looking at them and said, you know, I'm not going to pay you. Because you, you, you know, nobody cares about you, and I don't care about you. Nobody's going to advocate for you, and there's nobody to have to fear, and there's another thousand of you that can do the same job tomorrow. And so there they are in their desperation, holding these people up, and then brother so-and-so walks in, right, who's just like them, who is a refugee, who is uh, looking for all the things that they're looking for, but he doesn't have any power. He doesn't have any jobs. He doesn't have any influence. He can't provide them any security. And they're sussing between these two individuals and saying, okay, rich guy, jobs, money, maybe security, help to kind of recoup my reputation. I was like, well, let's put him up in the high seats. Who's a brother so-and-so? You know, he's a bum like me down here, right? I don't have any time for you, right? You can't offer me anything. And so this issue here is James is not over against assessing people uh, over against a certain value system. What he's against is people evaluating them based on a secular worldly value system. They don't know who truly is rich. They don't know who truly is poor. And they're operating the same way you would in the secular world. And you would think, well, who can improve my standing among this group of people? And so they're looking in the same way that you would look at, well, who's the beautiful people that I can hang around? Who's the powerful people that I can cozy up to? Who's the group that if I get with, it'll look good on me? Who's the people that have the money? Who's the people that have the influence? Who's the people that have these things? So the issue of their evil motives is they're no longer trusting that God is good. They no longer trust that his laws, 
that his direction is the path to freedom. They just chuck that all out the side and they said, we'll figure this out on our own. And unsurprisingly, they look just like the world does. And so who they value would be the same that you would find in any setting in the Greco-Roman world. And so there, the, he points to the, the uh, spectacles laying on the floor. Now, what does he do from here? Now what he wants to do is he's going to go back to Scripture and do a little exercise with them to say we need to put God's spectacles back on, right? We need to look differently. And so he comes to verse 5 and he says, listen, right? So here, listen, pay attention. My dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Now, these are all rhetorical questions, right? So James is not expecting that uh, the answer is always yes. <laughs> yes, that's true, right? But he wants them to think about it. And, and the truth is, in this room, the poorest person, the person who's least well-known, the person who has the littlest amount of influence in any group of people, but knows Jesus is incalculably rich and more wealthy than Bill Gates. More powerful in things that really matter than President Biden. Someone who has more wisdom, more perspective on terms of how to live life because they're anchored to Jesus than the wisest person who's selling all the books. Because Jesus made it clear, you can gain the whole world, what? And lose your soul. Right? Jesus is everything with cherries on top. Without Jesus, it's nothing. So the wisest person without Christ is not as valuable for your walk with the Lord, for you to give attention to and honor than the lowliest believer because they're a kingdom citizen. And so James wants to come at that and he's trying to get at their value system that's all screwed up. And we know this, right? The psychological studies. We know how we're wired and some of it that we fight, right? Uh, we're wired in certain ways and we're, our culture is always influencing us to say people who have nice bodies value are more valuable than people who don't. People who are beautiful are more worthy of my association than people aren't. Psychological studies all the time will talk to you about how adults will respond differently to children based on how beautiful they think they are. This person, and it gets, even gets a dark one, right? In a moment where people feel guilty about certain things, even from the past and racial issues, all of a sudden you begin to prefer certain people of a certain color because you want to be viewed as virtuous. It's not so much that you're interested in them, you just want the right association so that you can get the guilt monkey off of your back and you can look better. So this is not a simple thing in terms of how we operate with preferences, but the world has a whole set of way of operating. And when we look at people, somebody who uh, uh, is a, a, a guy who, um, and, and what often happens on top of this is not only do we value people on the wrong uh, uh, rubric, but then we have different expectations for behavior based on how we value them. So many of us, because we love athletes, we still continue to worship the athletes even if he's beating his wife at home. I really like what he does on the field. And he gets away with that. Why? Because he has such high entertainment value. Have you seen that guy play? And so in the same way in a family, right, the darkness of favoritism is holding one child to a standard that you don't hold the other one to because you favor that one over the other one. You let them get away with things that you wouldn't let the other child get away with, right, because you favor them. And so the two things that he's talking about here is not only are you operating according to God's value system, which he's going to say is rooted in everyone's created in the image of God and equally valuable. And that if you're going to have influences in your life, you need to make sure that you're letting 
people who have God's wisdom be the influences in your life. And if you're elevating people to people that you listen to and follow, they should be people who love Jesus. You need to be careful in terms of how you do that. So James is having this group of people, and they've dumped God. They don't think that it's, for me to honor this poor guy in here, that's not going to get me anything. I can't get any job from him, can't get any resources from him. I can't move forward with him, so I don't have time for him. But this guy, he's got opportunities. And, and, and James goes, isn't he cursing Jesus? This is one of the key tests here. If you're elevating people who curse the name of Jesus, you need to think about your value grid. If those are the most important advisors in how you dress, in what you wear, and how you think about relationships, if those are your advisors, you need to be wary. So James is looking at them and saying, you got to put these glasses back on. Then he continues, and he, he says here, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into the court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? And the answer is yes, 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 right, in terms of that. But they've, they've taken God's glasses off. They're operating with the world's glasses. And it's like, that's just what you have to accept, right? Sometimes when you're in your job and your career, right, you can deny Jesus. You can go incognito for Jesus. You can tolerate a whole bunch of behavior because you say, I got to keep my job. That's my boss, right? Now, I'm not talking about disrespect, I'm talking about the person that you are is what you ought to hold everyone in your life to the same standards, you included, which has got what God requires. And so you're not motivated by trying to find, right, it was the wind blowing, how am I going to come out best out of this thing? You're asking the question, how can I represent Jesus best in this moment? His values, his priorities, right? That may make people in your family mad at you. It may make people at your work not want to associate with you. And that's not your goal. Your goal is to be faithful to Jesus because the way to love your colleagues and your family is to point them to Jesus. For you to diminish Jesus is actually to hate your colleagues. This is where he goes next. And so this is what he says. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers, right? So they're breaking the law. To love your neighbor as yourself, right, falls under the larger command of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so to love your neighbor as yourself is to love them toward what God created them to be and wants to redeem them to become. That's to love them. I want to love them into a sense of their identity as created by God, and I want to hold that out to them, and I want to introduce them to Jesus if they don't know Jesus. That's to really love them, right? So if I'm doing that, and, but first it assumes that that's really what I think is the most important thing in life, because to love myself appropriately is to love God primarily, because that puts me in my right place and gives me an idea of what I really am, of my dependence on him, of my need for him, and it makes me behave in a particular way, and that's what it means to love myself under loving God. And if I become that kind of person, what I want for Grant, what I want for Steve Ruffner, what I want for Allie, is I want them to know Jesus. And the best thing I want to do is I want to commend him. I want to encourage them. I want to testify to him. I want to be faithful to him as I walk through that. If I'm discouraging them from trusting in Jesus, if I'm encouraging them to think that Jesus isn't worth taking a hit for, if it's my job is more important than faithfulness to Jesus, if being liked by the people around me is more important than faithfulness to Jesus, if I'm doing that, I'm hating my neighbor. That's what James is talking about. The irony is, at the end of the day, as they're trying to suck up to the rich and they're putting the poor here, they're encouraging the rich. Now think about how dark this is. They're encouraging these rich who curse the name of Jesus to trust in their riches, to be elevated and to think that their gifts and their abilities and the things that they've got, they're being honored for that. And they're being encouraged to do what is the propensity of people who are powerful and rich is to think that they're the master of their own destiny and they don't need anyone. 
So they're being encouraged in that mindset. And then people who are believers in Christ are being discouraged from thinking that they have true riches. So they're hating their brothers and sisters by making them think if they just had what the rich had, then they would really be full. And they're discouraging the rich from thinking that they truly are bankrupt. And so at the end of the day, hate predominates and they're not living out the perfect law that gives freedom because they're judging other people, making estimations of other people's value based on a worldly standard. And so as he comes here, right, at the end of it, I found this one here, keep calm and put your glasses on, right? Uh, and one of the things, if you're under pressure, one of the things that you have to do patiently, and as Pastor Steve was talking about this time, first thing is be quiet. Open up scripture, get somebody around you who knows Jesus, and listen before you freak out, before you do something desperate, right? And he says here, at the end, when he comes to the end, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, right? So what do you do? God, I don't know how to get through this. This job is really difficult. This person who just broke up with me has crushed my heart. God, I'm lonely, and I, I've, I've wanted to have a family. I've wanted to have these things, and I'm lonely, God. Maybe I need to go figure this out on my own. Maybe I need to find my own guy. Maybe I need to set down some of my Christian standards and push you to the background so I can get somebody. And it said, no, no, quiet, quiet. Sit down. Open your Bible. Listen. Listen. Get somebody to hold on to you, hold on to me for you. Sit around. Listen. Listen. Hold on. Put the glasses back on. Don't take them off. Put them back on. God's good. He's always good. Every resource that you need has come down. Listen. Right? Listen. Don't freak out. Don't run. Keep calm. Put your glasses on. Right? And that's what he says here. Let God's word be your standard. Okay? And then he warns them, right? When you operate without mercy toward your brothers and sisters and toward these lost people, right, the standard, right, of the law is going to be brought to bear on you. And if you break the law, the law is going to come down on you. And here's what he's saying. This is something that, that this kind of enigmatic passage here, you know, one of the things that we love to do with each other and we love to do with ourselves, we like to think we're doing well as long as we're keeping some of what God requires. And we love to major on that part, right? I'm doing really well over here. I'm doing well with this. I'm doing well with that. And it may be, I, I know this in myself. I, I love these people. And I love these people. And I love these people. I know I don't love this person, but hey, I'm doing really well otherwise, right? So this person, I can't hardly stand them. This person, I try to do everything I can to avoid them. This person, I struggle to want their good, right? Because of what they've done or whatever the case may be. But I'm doing good in these other areas. And, and James comes back and says, you know, wait a minute, you're just a lawbreaker. Yeah, you know, you know, but James, I'm not, I, I'm not committing adultery. Yeah, but Greg, you are a murderer. Yeah, but, but I'm doing really good on this part. And, and James is just walking back in and saying, no, if you're truly devoted to God, if you're fully devoted to him, you want him to penetrate every area of your life. So don't come back at me and say, but hey, I'm faithful to Jesus in my private time, but when I go to school, I go incognito for Jesus. Uh-uh. You know, when I'm around my Christian uh, uh, moms and dads and I'm around the Christian family, this is the way I was in junior high. Yeah, I'm, I'm a person that's perceived to be faithful to Jesus. I say all the right things and do the right things, and then when I get around my peers, they don't even know that I'm committed to Christ. I try to do everything I can short of the most egregious things that my conscience won't let me do, but I still want to come away liked by them and felt to be one of them. I don't want Jesus to get in the way of my friendships. Right? So this is the kind of thing that James is after. James says, wait a minute. The only way you're going to get through these times of pressure is by an unadulterated full devotion to me. Trust me, walk with me, listen to me. That's where he's after. So I remind you of this chart, and I'll bring it back to you at various other times. Every time you come into a time of difficulty, there's going to be a party in the ways. 
where you're going to have a choice between trusting God and following the path that he has laid out for you, or you're going to take the path of death. The difference is not going to be at any moment. We, we, were, we were singing today. He's my own defense. He has got every resource I need. And this is not to make us feel bad. This is to encourage us today that struggles you're going to face with your wife or your husband or with your mom or dad or with your employer or with the darkness in your own soul, the evil desires in your own heart, you have every resource in Christ to say no. You have every resource in Christ to behave differently. You have every resource in Christ not to fall under those things and take a path that leads you to death. But you've got to choose what you're going to appropriate. And trials, I know I mentioned this to you before, trials are often God's mercy to show us our faithlessness. It's very instructive to pay attention to you to see where you run when the house is burning down. It's God's mercy to take the facade off of your false Christian commitment. It's also the moment where he wants to prove himself to be the only sufficient necessary source for life. He wants to bring you to the end of yourself so that you turn to him and learn how to make much of him and not much of you. Humble us before him. I came across this verse the other day, and I leave this with us, and I want to pray. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. Hold fast to him. I don't know what you're in today. I don't know what struggles you face. I don't know what the perennial darkness is that you, you rest. I don't know what your fears are. I don't know if your difficulty is the fact that you're just a kind of a careless person and Jesus is just kind of on the periphery of your life, right? He's there. You're glad that he's there, but he really doesn't mess around with you too much. I don't know really where you are. I, I just want to say to you is that the only way, the only way that you can navigate the things that either are happening or will happen, right? As we've said before, we're broken people. We live in a broken world. Bad things are going to happen. And the only way you're going to hold fast to truth, to joy, to purpose, the only way you're going to be a blessing to people instead of a curse to them in the midst of your own suffering, the only way you're going to provide hope and not despair is if you hold fast to him. And the good thing is, he's strong enough. He's big enough. He loves you. And he's not like some of us dads sometimes that when our kids came to us and asked us for help, we just got irritated and said, quit bothering me. God says, I'm a generous God, and I don't rebuke anybody for asking for help. All right? Stand with me, will you? Let's pray together, and I'll release you today. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, uh, Lord, for your many kindnesses to us today. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, what you have delivered us from in Christ, for those of us who, by your grace, have called out to you to save us, is you've saved us from the foolishness, the stupidity, of the idea that we could save ourselves or make sense of life on our own. And Lord, it began, our walk with you began when we stopped telling you what to do, we stopped trying to figure it out, and we humbled ourselves before you and drew near to you and you drew near to us by your grace. And Lord, that's the pattern that you want us to do day after day. Lord, every day, you're our one defense today, tomorrow, the next day, till you return, you're our one defense. Lord, please do a work among us as your people. May husbands, wives, parents, children, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, Lord, please would we hold fast to you. Help us, Lord. Strengthen our grip. Lord, take us deeply into the fact that you have loved us and rescued us and all the resources that we have in you. Lord, help us when we doubt your goodness to set at the cross. When we doubt your commitment, we can set at the cross. When we doubt the depth of your love, we can set at the cross. When we doubt your power, Lord, set us down at the empty tomb. Lord, give us hope. Lord, may we be a people where you don't find cynicism. You don't find hopelessness. You don't find uh, anger and bitterness. God, deliver us, please. 
Lord, help us to become people who love each other enough that we're willing to step into each other's stuff. God, help us to be so tied to your truth and to your goodness that we're willing to take loneliness, if that's what it means. We're willing to be by ourselves. We'll be willing to uh, put up with um, rejection or rebuke or anger. God, help us, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for all you give us. Bless these men and women. Encourage them. Help us to walk with you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.